So one more time we meet my brothers and sisters. I'm happy to be here. First of all, greetings for your excellencies, for my dear brothers, uh, priests, here gathered, for nuns, and for you all, my brothers and sisters. And it's a great pleasure and great honor to be here. I've never thought in my life, never, that from Krakow, in Rome, I'll be once in Asia speaking about John Paul II and the message of mercy and Sister Faustina was like, my hometown is Krakow. I'm, I'm born in Krakow, so you know, I know Sister Faustina like since I remember. I've never thought. It, it's really great honor for you. Let me start with a small testimony, you know, because when I was going to the airport, there was this taxi driver and uh, he was asking me where I was going, for what reason, etc., etc., and said, I, I, go to, I fly to, to Malaysia for the Asian Apostolic um, Congress of Mercy. And he was like, Father, does it change something, this Congress? <laughs> and I said, you know, it does. Because we will be lifted up. Our faith will be stronger. Our hope will be stronger. And we will come back home stronger. And you know, that's why is this Congress. If someone will ask you why we gather here, because we want our faith make stronger. We want to have eyes of the Lord, you know, to see poor people, to help them. And that's why is this Congress. So we want to open our hearts. We want to open our hearts for the message of the merciful God. And we want to change us, first of all each one of us. And let me start with this small talk about the mercy in life of St. John Paul II. Misericordiam Domini in Eternum Cantabo, that's Psalm 89. I will sing of your mercy forever, Lord. And to sing about the mercy of the Lord, the psalmist Ethan the Ezraite must have had an experience of the merciful Lord. I will sing of your mercy forever, Lord, is sung by Ethan, who is amazed by the Lord's actions, which were tangible but by Ethan himself. And if you want to understand properly how and why St. John Paul II wrote his own hymn of mercy with his life, if you want to grasp the meaning of the terms John Paul II used like, for example, the new imagination of charity. First, we need to examine the experience of the merciful Lord in his life. I believe that in order to see how the Lord acted in the life of the Saint Pope, we have to examine two major aspects or maybe two major experiences of his life. First is the, his experience of death, most especially during World War II. Second was his encounter in those in, with, in need. In addition to these experiences, there were patrons who guided Karol Wojtyła. Sister Faustina preserved Karol's heart from the terror of war. And Saint Brother Albert Chmielowski demonstrates to him how to serve those in need. Let's look more closely at these two experiences and signs in order that we may understand what mercy meant in life and teaching of the Pope John Paul II. Experience of death. If we look carefully at the biography of the future Pope, we quickly notice that as a young man, he did not have a simple life. The terror and the exposure of the danger of death, though varying in intensity at different moments to a greater or less degree, was ever present in the life of the young Carol. When Carol was nine years old, he had lost his mother, Emilia. And how important is the love of a mother for his child? This is so evident that I, I, I don't have to even explain it to, to us. And the intensity with which Carol Wojtyla experienced the loss of his mother is evident in the poem he dedicated to her. And let me quote this poem. Over this, your white grave, the flowers of life in white, 
so many years without you. How many have passed out of sight? Over this your white grave, covered for years, there is a steer in the air, something uplifting and like that beyond comprehension. Over this your white grave, O oh mother, can such a loving cease? For all his filial adoration, a prayer. Give her eternal peace. Yet what strikes us is how peaceful the poem is. Confronting himself with the mystery of death, Carol's painful experience results actually in appreciating love, which is over the grave and never cease. Obviously, it takes years to write a poem like this one. During this expanse of time, the feelings related to the grief were already transformed with the grace of the Lord into the affirmation of love. Another painful event that happens to the young Wojtyla was the loss of his older brother. It was only three years after his mother's death when Edmund suddenly passed away. The older brother was a medical doctor and contracted scarlet fever from one of his patients in a state hospital where he served as physician. Edmund was a very powerful person and a strong point of reference to for Carol during his year, his early years. The essential role of, that his brother played in his life is evidenced by the fact that his brother's stethoscope laid on the Pope's desk until the end of his life. After 50 years visiting the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, where his brother had graduated, the Pope John Paul II says, there are events that become deeply engraved in my memory. My brother's death, perhaps even deeper than my mother's death. Equally, because of the special circumstances, one may say tragic ones, and in view of my greater maturity at the time. And this maturity he will need very soon. The 6th of September, 1939, German troops captured Krakow. The terror of the Second World War began in the city with the arrest of professors of the Jagiellonian University. They were sent to the concentration camp in Sachsenhausen, Germany. The university was closed and Karol was no longer able to continue his studies. Moreover, his father became ill and the young Karol needed to work in order to raise the monies they would both need to survive. In 1941, upon returning home for dinner, Wojtyla found his father dead. And we can only imagine what was going on in the Karol's heart, living in a constant danger in occupied Poland, with the terror of war swirling around him, and yet to have no family members anymore left to share his thoughts and feelings which must have been so very painful. This is also the moment, as the future Pope said and confessed, in which he started to consider the priesthood as the personal vocation and way of his life. The loss of his loved ones was not his only encounter with that. On numerous occasions, Carol himself was in grave danger. He was arrested in a mass roundup in 1942, but released because he was working on a quarry, which was of vital importance to the German war machine and industry. Ted Schultz described how the other men arrested with him were sent to Auschwitz. On a sunny day in May, 25 of, the, of them were executed by a firing squad against the wall of that and the concentration camp. It was one of Wojtyla's several brushes with that during the war. At the quarry, a worker next to him was killed. Karol was transferred from the Solvay fact to the Solvay factory where he had more time to read and, and pray, but he still lived in terror. Later, looking back on this period, John Paul II wrote, sometimes I would ask myself, 
so many young people of my age are losing their lives. Why not me? His friend, the writer Wojciech Żukrowski said Wojtyła told him not to describe any underground activities they were involved to. Karol was afraid if he were arrested, he might break down and reveal what I would say. Here we come to a first lesson. Let us think of a young student in his 20s who had to face death of his parents and had to live amidst the daily drama of the Second World War. For this was Karol Wojtyla's life. Many facing the same situations may develop serious problems such as depression and acedia. It is normal to feel sadness and sorrow when we have to confront the sudden death of our parents. And how many times did we have this kind of experience? How many times listening to the notification of death of a loved one, be they relatives, close friends, colleagues, have we felt ourselves deflated? Facing death often results in the loss of hope and in an increased sense of meaninglessness in line. The experience of that can close us in ourselves and in some cases even destroy our one's faith. But this was not the case for Karol Wojtyla. Wojtyla dealt with that in such a way as to affirm life which can only be realized in Jesus Christ. I do not want to reflect upon as many armchair psychologists and psychiatrists already have, how the loss of their parents and the terror of war affected the future choices, decisions, and emotions of Karol Voltiwa. For greatly superior to this psychological and emotional dynamics is the logic of faith. For those of us who believe in God, there exists the grace of the Lord, which strengthens us to fulfill the plan that God has formed for us. After many years, we can see how the grace led the young Carol to become a son. This collaboration between the young Carol Wojtyla and the grace of the Lord was realized in his life of daily prayer. As previously mentioned, during the German occupation of Poland, a future pope was forced to labor in a limestone quarry named Solvay, which was an open pit mine in which he dug out rocks and stones. The distance from this quarry Solvay to St. Faustina tomb was only a few hundred meters. And we have many testimonies which describe the long periods of prayer that worker Wojtyla made during breaks at Solvay. He himself wrote, during the Second World War, I worked as a laborer in a Solvay factory near the monastery of Łagiewniki. I often visited the grave of Sister Faustina, who at the time was not yet beatified. Everything about her was extraordinary. Impossible to foresee in such a simple girl. How could I have imagined that one day I would beatify her and canonize her. She entered the convent in Warsaw and was later sent to Vilnius and finally to Krakow. A few years before the war, she had a great vision of the merciful Jesus who called her to be apostle of the devotion to the divine mercy. Later, to spread throughout the church, Sister Faustina died in 1938. Devotion to the divine mercy began in Krakow and from there took on a worldwide dimension. When I became Archbishop of Krakow, I asked Professor Father Ignacy Ruzicki to examine her writings. At the first, he didn't want to, but later he agreed and went on to make a thorough study of the available documents. And finally, he said, she was a wonderful mystic. This life of prayer and the mysticism of divine mercy worked to perform a great miracle. It transformed Wojtyla's experience of death 
and the terror of war into the very path that he would follow toward the Lord. There is no coincidence for those who believe in God. Living this oppression each day, instead of learning vengeance, the young Carol connected deeply with the secret heart of Jesus in the school of mercy led by Sister Faustina. As the Pope, he will quote from Sister Faustina's diary and share his experience. Anyone may go there in the Sister Faustina's chapel, gaze on the image of the merciful Jesus with the grace radiating from his heart and hear in the depths of his soul what Sister Faustina heard. Fear nothing. I am always with you. Whoever answers with a sincere heart, Jesus, I trust in you, will find solace for all their fears and anxieties. But Carol's internal experience of prayer and grace are not the only things that shape his heart. We know that the encounter with the merciful and living God does not limit itself to the spiritual dimension. The mercy learned during hours of prayer would be also put in practice. And Voltiwa's family lived modestly and simply. And this is the reason that he learned that in life one does not need many things to live with dignity. This modest lifestyle marked his entire life and was what he became legendary for. We have numerous testimonies of how, how Karol Wojtyla acted on behalf of the poor. I would like to quote two of them. Father Franciszek Konieczny, one of Wojtyla's colleagues from the seminary said, he practiced works of mercy. He learned that from the great prince and metropolitan archbishop, Cardinal Sapieha, who sold all his possessions to help, using Brother Albert's word, lady poverty. We watched every day the line of the poor who gathered in front of the waiting room of Mr. Franciszek, wishing to obtain permission to meet Cardinal. After some time, Kraków's poor started to gather at the door of our apartment. They demanded to summon Father Wojtyla. I remember how a man knocked on our door and asked for Father Karol. Wojtyla went to the man talking with him in the corridor after returning to the room. He bent down and from a suitcase located under his bed took a sweater hiding under his cossack. He left the apartment and come back soon after. He gave the poor man his brand new sweater which only the day before was given to him. From then on, he himself was freezing and shivering in the cold weather. I do not know from where he gathered what he gave, nor where he acquired it, but often people come and ask for him. He shared with the poor people what he could. Another story that I have chosen to share with you reveals Karol Wojtyla always looking after people in need. This story involves a young Hebrew girl. Polish-born Edith Zierer was 13 when she ran away from the Nazi camp at Częstochowa in Poland after the Soviet army liberated it in January 1945, five months before World War II ended in Europe. She was heading towards her hometown in Poland to find her family, who she would later learn had died in the Holocaust. Exhausted, she reached a train station and sat there for two days without food or water while people ignored her. Suddenly, there he was, Edith said, referring to Wojtyla. He brought me some tea and two pieces of bread with cheese, and then he carried me to the train carriage. He sat with me and put his cloak on me because it was freezing. 
Edith Thierer said she was so exhausted that without the help offered by Wojtyla, she would certainly die. However, it was not the only example of his family or that of Cardinal Sapieha which inspired Wojtyla to live a simple life. At the heart of this decision to share his life with poor lies a powerful spiritual character, Adam Chmielowski, known today as Sound Brother Albert. We do not know origins of the interest of the future Pope in Brother Albert, but Karol Wojtyla must have known about him since a very early age, as he was quite popular in Krakow. He could not have met him on the streets of Krakow, as Brother Albert has been deceased for four years before Wojtyla, Wojtyla was born. We can learn how important Brother Albert and the religious order which he founded were for the young Karol Wojtyla from his later, later homilies. You have no idea, Wojtyla said in the church of the Albertine sisters in Krakow, what the Albertine habit means on the streets of Krakow or anywhere in Poland. It is a symbol of this extraordinary man, a symbol of the gospel, a symbol of service, the service to the most dispossessed and abandoned people. Carol was inspired by the actions which St. Brother Albert performed for those in need. In the preface to the biography of Adam Chmielowski, Brother Albert, written by Władysław Kluza, Cardinal Wojtyła wrote, the size of his soul and rich inner life speak to the depth of his choice and the maturity of the withdrawal he made because of this choice. Choosing absolute poverty and ministry to the most socially disadvantaged people, he faced the problem that continues to dominate the life of humanity and the church. This unique melding of an inner life of prayer with the selfless actions directed to the poor allowed the young Carol to discover the beauty of his vocation. Brother Albert, Adam Chmielowski, occupies a special place in my memory, said John Paul II, or rather in my heart. He fought in the January insurrection during which a bullet wounded his leg. It crippled him, and from then on, he wore a prosthetic leg. He was an outstanding figure for me, and I was spiritually very close to him. His personality fascinated me, and he became a model for me. He gave up art in order to become a servant of the poor, gentleman of the road. His example helped me to abandon the arts and the theater in order to enter the seminary. As the conclusion, my brothers and sisters, misericordiam domini in acternum cantabo, I will sing of your mercy forever, Lord. Looking closely at the life of John Paul II, one cannot but recognize the challenging and the painful moments that had to endure. However, contrary to human odds and the purely rational, he learned in these very circumstances how to be merciful. Carol put his hands in those of Saint Sister Faustina and Saint Brother Albert and allowed these models of faith to shape his heart and his actions in order that he become merciful like the Father. It is this mercy which is reflected in all of his actions and all of his teaching. His merciful life did not consist in only sporadic or occasional acts of mercy toward the people in need, but it was his constant attitude towards all the, all the other people. The origin of this attitude lays in the merciful love, which can only be learned on bended knee before the Lord. St. John Paul II showed us in this way 
that we can sing forever the mercy of the Lord if we open our hearts to his grace and follow him in our everyday action. This is how we can too proclaim our own hymn of mercy. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Reverend Fathers, men and women religious, lay fellow devotees, Selamat Pagi. Thank you, Your Excellency, Bishop Christoph, for that deep and touching presentation on the divine mercy and the life and writings of St. John Paul II. Congratulations and thank you, Malaysia, for hosting my first Asian conference. Thank you. <laughs> As a Filipino, I thank God that though we live in a third world country, we are the third joyful people, according to the Gallup polls of 2018. If we were a first world country, would we be first joyful in the world? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Are there Filipinos here, by the way? I think only about 700. <laughs> May I remind you, Jesus was born and lived in the largest continent which is Asia, Ecclesia in Asia. Do you believe that? Okay. Is the spark that emanated from Poland being inflamed by those from Asia? Are there Asians here? Can we all shout Asia? Asia. I am excited, but also a bit shy that I have to share my life story side by side, that of St. John Paul II, a great saint. I got married a year after I graduated from medical school to my classmate, Evelyn. Remember her name, Evelyn. <laughs> by 1989, after four years together, I was not happy in my marriage as well as with my medical career. Then I got invited to train under an American ophthalmologist in Santa Maria, California, and saw this as an opportunity to advance my career and to escape from my marriage. After a while in Santa Maria, Evelyn tearfully informed me that our eldest daughter fell from the balcony of our two-story house and sustained a serious head injury. And my daughter was asking for me. I was shaken, but I did not want to go home. My plan, number one, to run away from my marriage was in jeopardy. And eventually, I went back home to Evelyn in the Philippines. Saint Teresa of Calcutta said, if you want God to laugh, tell him some of your plans. God must have died laughing at my plan, my crazy plan <laughs> to escape from my marriage. I am sharing with you this morning five of my top 
secret personal plans. If Jesus had five wounds, St. John Paul II had five loves, I have five plans. <laughs> so, that was my plan number one, which God laughed at, I may add. My plan number two, since I am now back with Evelyn and my daughter miraculously recovered, she is now a 31-year-old consultant in internal medicine, I will give my best to my career in ophthalmology and become rich and well-known and have a long list of mistresses. <laughs> However, not long after, in 1990, there occurred an intensity, intensity 9 earthquake that devastated and paralyzed our city and killed at least a thousand people. I could not hold clinic for months and felt I was to blame for the loss of lives and property. God laughed at my plan number two. Again, especially of wanting a long list of mistresses or concubines. Two months after the earthquake, Evelyn and I were invited to attend a charismatic renewal seminar for married couples. Despite the aftershocks and the nuclear wars between us, we persevered and completed the 13th weekend seminar. We both agreed to join the religious organization which invited us. Meanwhile, Evelyn and I did try our best to renew our relationship. We became lovebirds again, and she became pregnant two more times. <laughs> little by little, I developed a personal prayer life, read the Bible daily, prayed daily as a family, learned more about my Catholic faith, and served on weekends other couples in our newfound charismatic community, sometimes abandoning my clinic for out-of-town outreaches. My plan number three. At 35 years old, I decided to quit my now advancing career in ophthalmology and apply to be a full-time missionary in our religious organization. I will receive a salary, but not much. Evelyn brought me to a psychiatrist <laughs> who diagnosed me with an incurable here I am Lord syndrome. <laughs> My parents also threatened to disown me. However, years later, I was able to evangelize them to become members of our religious organization. After two years of discernment, I was accepted as a full-time missionary doctor by our religious organization. This time, God did not laugh at my number three plan <laughs> to serve God. Praise the Lord. I went on to work in the family renewal programs of my organization. As a missionary for 18 years, I traveled often to several mountainous provinces in the Philippines, in Africa, specifically Kenya, Ethiopia, Namibia, and in the Middle East, namely Egypt, Qatar, Bahrain, Yemen, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates. Though used to an easy, comfortable, and vain lifestyle in the past, I took 12-hour bus rides, slept on benches, got beaten by mosquitoes, dressed up below my fashion standards, conquered my stage fright, that's why I'm able to stand here before you with trembling knees. <laughs> Survived road accidents, said many hellos and goodbyes to my family, and missed 
many meals. Once I was mugged in Addis Ababa, walked across the burning desert of Arabia, overslept in airports, suffered from food poisoning, struggled to speak Arabic, Ana es mi Tony, inta es meke, inta kwais, cried out of loneliness, escorted by armed guards in Yemen. You know, in Yemen, when we were there, it was already terrible. And uh, our host works for a Canadian company, and so every time they go out, they have to be accompanied by armed guards. And so that was maybe like 10 years ago. I was threatened by religious police in Egypt. Every time I go there, the religious police in Ismailia, Egypt, would come and see me and get my passport and ask me, what are you going to tell the people tomorrow? And his name is Mr. Nahmedo. Mr. Nahmedo. And I was so scared of him initially. <laughs> and during our seminars in the evening, he would come, he will, he will sit in the courtyard, he will smoke probably threatening me in a way, telling me, I am here, you better behave. <laughs> but then, you know what? We became friends. After I spent like 10 years in Egypt, going back and forth for like 10 years, uh, for a month stay, sometimes with my spouse. And after a while, Mr. Nakmedo would meet me with a cheek to cheek. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I was even chased by a lion in Kenya, believe it or not. When we were on a safari, we were trying to test the theory of uh, Daniel, Daniel and the lion. But then, unfortunately, the lions we encountered did not believe in God. <laughs> we had to run back to our vehicle. <laughs> and of course, the things that we do for the love of God, really. I impersonated Elvis Presley. There, that's Mr. Fake Elvis. <laughs> there was one conference, they could not get an entertainer. They said, hey, Tony, I think we could dress you up. <laughs> and so I pretended to be Elvis Presley, singing the Elvis songs. But do not pity me, though. I have a near-perfect family. I'm, I'm proud to say, humble to, altogether. Stayed in many beautiful homes, discovered countless distant relatives, made friends and ex-enemies, by the way, <laughs> and acquired diabetes from the many frequent buffets. All I can say is, I gave my all. No regrets. Are you still interested in plans number four and number five? <laughs> okay, I will accede to your request. My plan number four, after 18 years in our organization, I suspected the Divine Mercy devotion needed me. So I decided to take an early retirement. Two years before this, I was introduced to the Divine Mercy devotion. Wherever I was on mission at the time, I would share the Divine Mercy message and devotion and distributed prayer cards and images. I saw God was not laughing when I left our organization's mission office for the last time. God even affirmed me in my decision to leave my organization when Benedict XVI also resigned as Pope at the same time. <laughs> he told me, hey, Tony, I've heard from the Lord that you are resigning from your organization. So am I. <laughs> as a devotee, I joyfully and zealously share the devotion first to my family read the diary, helped organize Divine Mercy Sunday novenas and processions in my parish and elsewhere, traveled to other places to promote the devotion with bishops and priests, 
gave divine mercy seminars, befriended my persecutors, prayed for my enemies, gave alms, admonished sinners, prayed for souls, went to daily mass, said unceasingly the chaplet, prayed at three o'clock, did one merciful act a day, at least, almost, probably, told every taxi driver or anyone willing to listen that Jesus is merciful. And repeatedly murmured, Jesus, I trust in you every time. When I was waiting for my turn, I was in front of the image of Jesus and I just kept on murmuring, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Last year, Reverend Father Prospero Tenorio formed a lay group to help him with the apostolate, which I am now part of. Recently, I thought of one more plan to accomplish in my lifetime. My plan number five, don't laugh. It is for me to be holy or saintly. <laughs> this plan is not just mine. It is God's plan for everyone. <laughs> Diary 1333, quote, In spite of my wretchedness, I want to become a saint and trust that God's mercy can make a saint even out of such a misery as I am. And you know, when I left my religious organization, I encountered a saying from uh, St. Vincent de Paul that when he said, and I quote, you do not leave God when you leave God for God. That was my, my consolation. So my plan number five, to be holy or saintly. St. Faustina was not a saint at the beginning. Besides being poor, uneducated, and tuberculous. St. Paul II had only his father by age 20, as Bishop related to us, suffered terribly during World War II, and did not plan to be a priest, but an actor. Karol Wojtyła did not know one day he would canonize Sister Faustina, or one day be canonized himself and be dubbed the Mercy Pope. I was a terrible teenager, ran away from home, smoked cigarettes, joined pot sessions, I'm confessing, <laughs> overdosed on drugs, a drunkard, and took my studies for granted. One afternoon when I was 15 years old, from inside my ear, I heard a voice, Tony, you can't go on like this. You must change. Looking back, I did change <laughs> from then on. Sorry. I became serious with my studies. I didn't end up an addict. I even sought twice to enter the seminary but got rejected. <laughs> On August 15, 2018, I finished my personal consecration to Mary through the 33 days of morning glory by Reverend Father Michael Gately, MIC. According to St. Louis de Montfort, Marian consecration is the simplest, fastest, easiest path to holiness. I feel no longer the same since my Marian consecration. Consecrate yourself to Mary, star of the new evangelization. During my wayward years, I would get drunk almost every day, except on Wednesdays, when I would go for novena to the Our Lady of Perpetual Help. <laughs> Maybe it was her, years ago, who whispered in my ears for me to change my ways. John Paul II, the most Marian of popes declared, totus tuus, I am totally yours, Mary. My personal devotion to the divine mercy 
and my true devotion to Mary, the chaplet and the rosary would ensure my holiness. I know Jesus is not laughing at my plan to be holy. Quoting uh, Pope Francis, do not be afraid of holiness. It will not take away your joy. Instead, you will be faithful to your deepest self. Five years ago, my family was gifted with another apostolate, St. John Paul II Learning Center, a special education school for individuals with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and learning disabilities. It is indescribable how these beautiful and special yet vulnerable young people could give you so much joy and hope and teach you how to love. They are our extended family. Finally, I dedicate this, this testimony to my wonderful wife, Evelyn, who is not here. Sad to say. I'm missing her. And to my four children, who are my companions in my life's journey and who help me carry my load. I love them. So thank you, St. John Paul II. Tarima kasi. Greetings from the St. John Paul II education students. Jesus, I trust in you. Thank you very much. This is my first experience, you know, with the um, Divine Mercy Conference, and it just gave me, you know, like such a beautiful, beautiful uh, expression also of my faith. I would say that this conference is very wonderful too on my part because you know, it is very meritorious on the fact that you know this is my first time and I was able to confirm this devotion that's very grounded on the reality of our own faith and uh, I also came here with the fact that I want to increase all my devotion actually to the divine mercy and it's so merciful practically you know all the testimonies are so awesome it's so great it's very converting you know these are really practical theology they have mercy in action as we say and i thank uh, penang you know all the people are so warm uh, a lot of uh, prejudices maybe in terms of races but they were all melted by the divine mercy thank you Heavenly Father, I pray to you to bless Shalom TV, to bless the organizers, their families, all the collaborators. Inspire them with the spirit of wisdom to see what's to be done, courage to overcome obstacles, the generosity to sacrifice themselves for Shalom, and the realization that they're working for you, for the gospel, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them. Keep them close to you and to each other. And so I now I pray for all the Shalom viewers. I pray that the Holy Spirit comes down on them, that God blesses them, blesses their family, keeps them united, that they experience the presence of God, of Jesus, in their homes and in their lives. And so I bless you with the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
come down on you and remain with you always. God bless you. Keep well. Always love Jesus.